Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the RightScale and Amazon Web Services uh, webinar around data processing uh, grid and batch in the cloud. So we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, as usual, we have a few polls that we wanted to conduct, so stand by for those and we appreciate your participation. So the first poll should be up. If they can go ahead and just click on uh, one of those three options there, that would be great. And then all the results will be posted to everyone. So it would be helpful to get a sense of kind of who the audience is here. Interesting. Okay, the vast majority of you are, are curious about the cloud. So you have existing resources internally, uh, but curious to see what this is all about. Well, that's actually great. So we'll, we'll hopefully answer a lot of these questions and, and satisfy that curiosity. And it looks like now the second poll has been up. So if you go ahead and just check one of those four boxes, that would be appreciated. Okay, and let's see on this one. Yes, it looks like looks like pretty a pretty interesting allocation here. So we have a lot of initial exploration, so about forty percent, and then it looks like uh, about almost forty percent as well have a kind of near term or serious project uh, that this could be a potential solution for uh, the cloud. That is so. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for that. Okay, well that concludes the polls. So thanks everyone again for uh, giving us your your opinions there. So let's jump in. You know, again, thanks for joining. So I want to do a quick round of introductions on your panel today. Um, first off, this is Josh Fraser. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Business Development at RightScale. I will be your host and moderator today. Uh, I'm also joined uh, up in Seattle by Brian Matsubara. Uh, Brian is the Amazon Web Services ISV program lead. Uh, we have Dave Welch uh, here at RightScale, one of our sales engineers. And then as usual, we have the Q&A logs manned. Um, today we're joined by Daniel Howard, one of our account managers. So at any time during the webinar, please feel free to ask a question. Um, as usual, we'll answer questions during the webinar, and then we'll keep that Q&A log open uh, after we've completed the presentation and demo. Um, so keep those questions coming, and we'll stick around for as long as there's, uh, there's questions to answer. So today we're going to take you through a quick introduction of both Amazon Web Services and RightScale. Um, so do some level setting about what these resources are all about. Then we're going to take specific looks and demos around the automation that RightScale provides on a few of the key features from AWS related to grid and batch processing. Um, we do, as usual, have a couple different live demos, so we'll spend some time uh, in the right scale system itself, actually doing workloads on the Amazon Cloud. And then we're going to finish up with actually some economic analysis, uh, where we've quantified some of the key benefits here associated with moving to the cloud for your grid and batch processing needs. So to kick things off, I'm going to turn it over now to Brian Matsubara with Amazon Web Services. Brian. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, I appreciate the the introduction, and I want to thank everybody uh, for taking time out of this uh, beautiful St. Patrick's Day uh, to join us here on this webinar, and hopefully we will uh, make good use of this time, and that this will be educational for you as it relates to both Amazon Web Services and RightScale and some of the solutions that we're bringing to market. I'm just going to spend about five minutes uh, level setting, providing you with a high-level overview of Amazon Web Services, where we fit into Amazon.com's organization, the types of services we bring to the market, and the value that we see uh, our cloud computing offering uh, providing for our customers and our partners. So uh, a question that we often get is, you know, what, how does Amazon Web Services actually fit into the overall Amazon.com uh, business, and where do we fit in with inside of the organization? So it's really helpful oftentimes for us to just explain the three divisions of the side of Amazon.com. 
So first and foremost, we have the Amazon uh, retail side of the business. Hopefully, you know, everybody is, knows and or loves the uh, Amazon.com uh, shopping experience, where we have tens of millions of customers, and we provide a, uh, a hopefully an easy to use, uh, highly available e-commerce site uh, around the world. Then we also have the Amazon seller business. This, we, uh, we, we introduced this to allow third parties to be able to take advantage of our uh, e-commerce infrastructure as well as our fulfillment uh, network to be able to sell and distribute uh, goods online. And then finally, we have Amazon Web Services, which is our on-demand uh, uh, infrastructure as a service uh, cloud offering that we introduced to the market uh, probably about three years ago. It's, it ideally was uh, initially uh, uh, geared towards developers and, and IT professionals, but we're quickly seeing that uh, we're getting a lot of adoption with inside the enterprise uh, uh, Fortune 500 customer base as well. Okay, I, I wanted to take a, a minute just to explain some of the, the key attributes that uh, Amazon Web Services attributes to uh, cloud computing in general. Um, there are a number of different terms out there or different approaches to cloud computing. So I just want to make sure that everybody understood the, you know, the way that we see the world and the way that we believe uh, cloud computing is most impactful to our customers and our partners. So if you think about cloud computing, one of the things that we make sure that uh, people understand is that in order to have a true cloud offering, you really need to be able to provide your customers with abstract resources. Right? So resources that are purely, truly flexible and virtualized and not tied to any particular piece of physical hardware. That helps ensure uh, flexibility, but also helps ensure reliability in the sense that you're not tied to any particular physical machine uh, where you can, might have a disk dist drive fail or CPU fail or motherboard failure or something of that nature. We also want to ensure that, uh, you know, that we believe that our cloud services need to be freely available and on demand. Right? So when you need systems, when you need computing infrastructure, you have it at that moment and you have exactly what you need and when you need it. And most importantly, and this is something that we'll reiterate throughout the discussion, is that if you pay for only what you use, right? So if you need more computing, you pay for what you use. If you need less, obviously you pay, you pay less. So there's no fixed costs associated with your computing needs. Scalability is a third one, which is, again, of utmost importance to us and our customers. The cloud allows our customers to truly benefit from the infrastructure that we provided that allows your computing capacity to scale up as your demand increases, but also most as, as equally important, as allows it to scale down as your demand subsides. Right? By scaling up, you ensure that you're meeting your customers' SLA requirements, and by scaling down, you ensure that you're not actually spending money on computing infrastructure that's not currently needed at a particular time. The fourth one is no upfront costs. Uh, the cloud computing has introduced some interesting technologies to the market, but most importantly, we believe that it's actually introduced uh, some, some revolutionary uh, economic models uh, associated with compute. Right? So for the first time, you actually are able to benefit from high-performance computing and highly reliable storage with no capital investment up front. You simply pay um, as you go, as a utility, similar to how you pay for electricity. Right, so no upfront costs and no long-term commitments. And then finally, the last one is leveraging the efficiency of experts. Right, so Amazon uh, Web Services has been working on this functionality uh, for, you know, well, for, since we've launched the company, but um, as well, you know, from, like, we've been leveraging the expertise from Amazon.com, who's been building web services and APIs for the you know, last, uh, last 10 to 15 years. So, by taking advantage of Amazon Web Services, you're not only taking advantage of the, the easy to use, cost effective solutions we bring to the market, but you're also able to take advantage of the innovation that we continue to develop and drive on a daily basis. Okay. There's, the, the next two slides are really just to kind of drive home the, the, uh, the benefits to our customers around cloud computing. Another question we often get is, well, why would I look at using cloud computing versus doing it on-premise myself? A lot of people, you know, when you look at um, building and operating your own data centers, you know, you have to really go through the, the economic exercise to see, well, is it cost effective for me to leverage the cloud or is it something that I should just build, and own, uh, build myself and own and maintain myself? So there's direct costs associated with building out your own data centers. Right? So what, what people need to take into consideration when they're looking at the different infrastructure needs are whether or not um, uh, you believe over the long term you can actually achieve the economies and efficiencies of scale that Amazon Web Services brings to the market. So things that you need to take into consideration are the cost associated, the direct costs associated with building and maintaining 
on-premise data centers. Right? So think about server hardware, networking hardware, power, cooling, administration, uh, cabling, security, physical security for your data centers, um, and even all the operating system licenses associated with your machines. Right? So th these are costs that are going to be going, that are ongoing for you from both the capital as well as operational expense. From the Amazon Web Services perspective, you simply pay for the hours of compute to use and the data transfer, uh, the data transfer in and out of the cloud, as well as uh, data storage. The other thing to consider is not only direct costs, but also opportunity costs. Right? So if you are spending a lot of your hard-earned capital on uh, infrastructure, right, you're not investing that money into developing applications, developing services, developing solutions that really help differentiate you in the market against your competition. Right? We call this, the, um, the, we, we call this uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Right, so if you look today, a, number, a good number of the enterprise customers out there are spending 70% of their time and energy and, and capital on the, what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting. So the, the hosting, the administration, the maintenance of server infrastructure. And really only 30% of that time, 30% uh, of your time and dollars is actually spent on application development, uh, creating better services, improving your customer service. By leveraging the cloud, you actually can shift that. Uh, you can actually shift that equation, that ratio, and actually spend 70% of your time on actually differentiating your offering in the market versus doing uh, some of the mundane IT administrative costs that you know Amazon simply, well, d does, and we believe we do it fairly efficiently. Okay, this last slide is just to give you an idea as far as the the type of um, uh, infrastructure service offerings that we bring to the market. So if you're not familiar with Amazon Web Services, what we do is we actually provide fairly low-level infrastructure, uh, computing infrastructure components on a utility basis. So we provide uh, Compute, which is Amazon EC2, uh, which is uh, virtual computing, and that you pay on a per hour basis. We offer storage, which is Amazon S3, where you pay simply on a, a per gigabit per month for the amount of data that you actually have stored um, in, um, in our locations. And then we have a whole host of other types of services, such as database services with our relational database offering, uh, data, data service offering. We have um, uh, uh, monitoring through CloudWatch. We have uh, isolated networks uh, through our Amazon virtual private cloud offering. And then we also have um, uh, Amazon Simple Queuing Service, which is something that uh, we will talk a lot more about today as far, uh, with, uh, as, far as what RightScale has been able to build on top of our services. It's important to note that we provide these discrete services to the market on a utility basis, but we do depend on partners such as RightScale to actually help stitch all of these together to provide a comprehensive solution to the market. So during the demo, you'll see how RightScale has actually uh, put a very easy to use interface on top of Amazon Web Services that allows you to take advantage of Amazon EC2, Amazon S3, uh, as well as Amazon S2S. Josh, back to you. Great, well thanks Brian, I appreciate that intro and thanks for uh, taking some time out of your St. Patty's Day there. So hopefully you got a, you got a nice little coffee there if you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so let's let's introduce RightScale real quick. So one thing we like to start out with is just emphasizing that this is not hype. So this is very much real. Uh, it's been going on for a while, and there are companies, large and small, that are taking advantage of the cloud today and have been for quite some time. So we like to just simply say, hey, this is about real customers, real deployments, and real benefits. We've actually been at this with Amazon uh, literally almost since day one. So we launched the first version of the RightScale product uh, one month after EC2 launched with Amazon, so back in September 2006. Uh, we're very proud to announce that earlier this week, actually on Monday, we surpassed the one million server mark. So we launched our one millionth server uh, largely within Amazon's EC2 cloud. So great, great milestone not only for Amazon and RightScale, but frankly for the industry as a whole, because it's really giving a, a good example of just the type of adoption that's going on. As Brian mentioned, you know, where RightScale fits and kind of our role uh, in the ecosystem as it relates to Amazon is to essentially stitch together, orchestrate, and automate a lot of the fabulous services that Amazon extends from an infrastructure level. So think of RightScale as the layer between the applications that you run and the various different infrastructure providers uh, that are available. 
So let's jump in now and talk about um, bright scale for, for grid and batch processing in the Amazon cloud. And wanted to start first with a couple of the key challenges. I think this is something that a lot of you are probably facing uh, in your in-house environments, but they're worth repeating because the cloud has a pretty unique way that we can address this both from an operational standpoint uh, as well as an economic standpoint. So the first one is, is pretty straightforward. You know, as a user, you're looking at CapEx. You know, if you need to set up an internal grid, you're having to outlay cash up front. So that obviously is expensive and will ultimately dictate the size of the environment that you're capable of, of creating and supporting. Um, the second is around scheduling conflicts. Um, so one big problem we hear quite a bit for these types of use cases in all different industries are not having transparency or control over when your job gets completed. So you submit your job, it gets bumped by a higher priority job. You submit your job, you have no visibility or real control over when that job will be complete, so on and so forth. Finally is errors. Errors do happen. They happen all the time. We can probably all attest to that. Um, the reality is you have to deal with those errors. That often can lead to a significant overhead issue on your resources and also add significantly to the total time a job will take to process. So that's on the user side, just some of the, the three common uh, issues and complaints that we hear from internal traditional grid and batch processing. You know, if you're an operator, you're dealing with a high amount of repet rep repetition, excuse me, around setup and tear down. Um, so again, this takes time, it's complex, it's prone to error. Um, the second is the notion of licensing and support. So you're dealing with a finite set of resources, but you have multiple different constituents that you need to serve. So you're juggling licenses around these different resource pools and having to have your team support a variety of different business units with a variety of different workloads uh, addressing a variety of different use cases. It just gets complex and it gets expensive. And then finally, it typically is cost prohibitive to have you know, management systems and tools that are business unit or workload specific. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we solve uh, each of these key challenges and what this environment is all about. So what RightScale has done, and this is very common with our approach um, with all things Amazon, is that we'll look for different ways that we can stitch together and better automate and orchestrate Amazon resources around a specific vertical or around a specific workload. Um, what you're going to see today is some very focused automation and orchestration around three key Amazon services. Um, S3, their simple storage service, SQS, that's their queuing service that Brian mentioned at the end, and of course the EC2 Compute Cloud. Um, as with all things right scale, um, these resources and where you can orchestrate your deployments, um, there's full support for all of Amazon's regions. They have a region in the EU. Very important for data privacy issues. They have two different regions in the U.S., uh, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And they have announced, but not yet launched, uh, a region over at APAC in Singapore. Uh, in addition to the Amazon regions, you also have multiple different availability zones at your disposal. So we're going to talk a little bit later in the demo about how you take advantage of these availability zones. What RightScale has done with this grid and batch processing solution is we've developed this complete system. It's pre-configured. It's specifically addressed to handle graceful provisioning and deprovisioning of resources. Um, it includes a high degree of automation, scaling, and operational remediation. So we're going to talk about a few common use cases of when you want to use that and how you configure that later on in the demo. And further, it's created a series of automation and pre-configuration, again, around error, hand error handling, logging, and reporting. Um, so an easy way to think about this is we've taken a lot of the work that you would normally have to do and modify and do over and over again, and we pre-built it for you. Um, as with all things right scale, much of this is provided at source, so you have the ability to take this system, modify it as you see fit. You have the ability to clone this system in its entirety and use what we provided you. Or, of course, you can also take some of the modules within uh, right scale and piece together a system of your own. So it's very flexible, um, but you're going to leverage the pre-built uh, systems and work that we've done for you. And then last but not least, because of our vast experience in the cloud and because of our expertise around dealing with deployments at scale that are highly complex, um, you as a user can now leverage all of those best practices that have been learned by uh, the actual volume of the platform itself and then an extensive amount of experience within our consultative support uh, to help you architect a deployment that incorporates cloud best practices. 
So I want to spend a few minutes just on some of the use cases that we're seeing. Um, this is by no means all encompassing, um, but just to give you a flavor of who's taking advantage of this today. Um, all of these are actual real customers, um, at least one, but in many cases there are many, many customers that are taking advantage of this. So I just want to highlight uh, a few of the key things. Uh, first, in the biopharma and pharmaceutical space, um, we see a lot of needs around uh, various different uh, analytics, particularly around protein analysis. So these tend to be workloads that are just consuming resources internally needlessly because they're using public data sets. They're not as uh, subject to some compliance parameters that others may be. Um, typically that would take about a week to process the average job that we see. Um, so we have pharmaceutical clients that are completing these same jobs that used to take a week in a single day on the cloud. Uh, the next example we want to share is around uh, insurance claims, uh, specifically around fraud detection. Um, here's a situation, and this has been uh, this has this particular example has been disclosed publicly, but it's a big provider and servicer of HMOs and PPOs that analyzes terabytes and terabytes worth of data around insurance claims, looking for fraudulent activity. Um, normally, this type of processing would have literally required months based on the internal resources that they have. Uh, they were able to do this batch run in just a few days uh, with a dramatic cost savings by using AWS and RightScale. Um, next is around video. So we see quite a bit um, within the video space, both related to Web 2.0, but also anyone tied to Hollywood, so from the major studios to the independents um, to the vendors that serve them. So transcoding, rendering, encoding, it's a very compute-intensive process. Um, here we have the opportunity and we have customers leveraging this to take the actual rendering and encoding time from hours down to minutes. This also becomes very important when it comes to SLAs. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, SLAs later on, but these are situations where these um, companies are often serving end consumers with a certain set of expectations around when that product will be delivered. And last but not least is what we're seeing in the financial service industry. And I know many of you are from that space that are on the webinar today. So some of the common use cases that we've seen being embraced thus far are ways that you would use uh, this type of environment to do back testing, you know, taking the uh, day's close and the new option pricing and running your analytics and algorithms to figure out how would that have affected your portfolio or your trends uh, based on past trading activity. Um, again, here's a situation where because resource availability is incredibly vast and you're only paying for what you're using, you have the ability to set specific business rules, whether those are SLA based, whether those are cost based, um, to most effectively run the job that you need to run. So with that, let's take a very high level look at the right scale uh, architecture as it relates to grid and batch processing. Um, so you, of course, still have your job producer and consumer, so nothing's changing there. And we're going to talk about the, the options of how you'd approach that uh, in the next slide, I believe. Um, but there, you know, what RightScale has provided, again, is an orchestration around stitching together all of these key Amazon resources that are necessary to run these types of workloads. So RightScale is bringing in Amazon S3 buckets, Amazon's SQS input queue, um, as well as, of course, the raw processing power divided by, uh, provided by EC2. So this just gives you a very high level sense of how this is architected uh, within Amazon. And what we wanted to do now is actually take you through a typical flow. Um, so we'll take you through the flow on the slides, and then we're going to jump over to a demonstration and actually show you in the right scale system itself what happens here. So first, let's take a look at the input file creation and message queuing process. Uh, what happens at the beginning is going to be very familiar. You know, this is a very uh, fairly typical process that I'm sure most of you go through if you're familiar with this, uh, these types of workloads. So the job producer is going to create, you know, both the input files as well as the work unit. The input files are then automatically placed in the appropriate S3 bucket. You know, again, this is a lot of the orchestration that RightScale is providing. Uh, and then next, this work unit is packed into a message, and then that message is uploaded into Amazon's simple queuing service. So Josh, it's important to note that with the job producer, we, you know, we have customers running it you know, internally, and also we have customers running it within the AWS cloud. Uh, that's a good point, Dave. Thanks for bringing that up. So yeah, so right, the, the piece that RightScale is not incorporating this is the actual job producer and job consumers. So there's flexibility here where if you want to use your own, that's okay. 
Um, if you want to actually run that within Amazon, we have plenty of customers that are doing that as well. Um, so that's certainly something that we can help you navigate uh, and incorporate best practices, but you have the flexibility. We're not asking you to strip out you know, the existing job producer that you uh, become comfortable with using internally. So let's jump to the next process now and take a look at um, the actual the actual work queuing and um, work unit processing. What happens here first is RightScale is going to instantiate a server or servers. Um, so this is done based on the automation and various different uh, provisioning rules that you as a user can set within the RightScale system. We're going to talk more about that uh, later on in the demo, how you go about you know, configuring various different behaviors here in terms of the type of environment that you want to create up. The next step of the process is that worker daemon is going to copy the message out of the work queue. It's going to unpack it and then download the respective files out of the S3 bucket. Uh, so a lot of logistics, a lot of orchestration going on here, but again, this is all automated within the right scale system. The application code is then called, uh, and the worker begins to do its work. From there, the output files and the log files uh, are both placed back into the appropriate directory. And then finally, the results are returned back to the daemon for further processing. And so, Dave, you know, one, one question that commonly comes up is what modifications, if any, are needed to the application itself? No, that's a great question. Or in short, you know, very little modifications are needed. You know, RightScale makes it you know, easy so your application just modifies or operates on local data and doesn't have to worry about the logistics of the messages and you know, uploading the result files to S3. Okay. No, good. Thank you. And just a reminder, too, please don't forget to uh, ask any questions at any time, and we'll just chime in and, and address them one by one here while the webinar is going on. So let's take a look at the, the final step in the process here, which is the results handling. The first step here are these output and log files are uploaded back into the respective uh, S3 buckets. Next is the temporary input, input files are deleted from the associated directory. You know, from there, the right scale system is going to leverage a series of pre-configured queues from which they're going to create place the various different results of this job that you've just run. So the successful results are placed back into the results queue. Uh, these can also be posted to a server. Uh, otherwise, the error results uh, are placed in a specific error queue uh, that is automatically created by right scale. And then finally, all of the various different queue statistics are placed in that audit queue. Uh, you can go back and analyze that and use that information, and Dave's going to show you how you do that within RightScale. And then to complete the process, that message is then deleted from the input queue. So after having gone through those three flows, I want to now turn it over to Dave, who's going to spend a little bit of time in the RightScale dashboard itself and show you how you would do what you just saw in the slides, but leverage a pre-configured grid architecture, and then show you some of the various different uh, queue uh, interactions within RightScale. All right, thanks, Josh. So I'd like to start off by submitting a batch of jobs that we can be begin to process for this demo. I'm going to do that by running Start Analysis Script. So this is a single server that you've set up, Dave, that will kick off this whole process? Yeah, so this is an example of running it in the AWS cloud, but it's important to note that these jobs can be picked up automatically. In this case, for the demo, I'm manually running or manually submitting these jobs. So in fact, on the, on the automatic, that can be something that's set on a schedule, right? So we use that internally for our own analysis, where every single morning at a certain time, a job will kick off you know, processing the prior day's results. Exactly. And then you can even incorporate um, spot prices to you know, get the uh, best price for your instance. Interesting. Okay. Right. So what this script did is it uploaded the uh, input files to S3 and then submitted the messages to uh, the S2S input queue. So in a moment here, you'll see uh, about 10 servers boot up to handle the job volume. But what's key in this process is RightScale server templates. So each server is based off a server template. So it, in essence, it knows how to create or configure itself when it boots up. So Dave, that, that, that's an important point, so let's, let's spend a few seconds on that. So you have a single server that is triggering an entire system. In this case, it's going to launch, I guess, 10 workers that are going to do a respective job. But all 10 of those servers are instantiated and provisioned and brought into this environment using a single server template. 
Exactly, yeah. single, single server template. So that makes it very repeatable and you know very flexible. So you, it knows which queues to start you know pulling messages from and where to store the result files. And that's actually the secret sauce to how you can actually define these systems without necessarily having to be running resources within Amazon. So just another way another way to optimize costs and get the most efficiency out of your your grid and batch workloads is you can build and design these systems as many as you want. We actually call them deployments within RightScale uh, ahead of time as the actual resources that charge you money from Amazon come and go. Now that's actually a very good point. And, and as you can see on the left hand side, you know, we've got about our, uh, in this case, nine workers boot up to handle the job volume. So next I want to get and talk about results handling. So do, to do that, I'm going to jump into the queues. So Dave, you just launched, what, nine or ten servers just then? Okay. And we're not having to go in now at that route and do any no additional configuration? No, that's right. They're all pre-configured to, so RightScale is monitoring the queue size and it's provisioning the servers on your behalf. And then those server templates will, will take care of you know, configuring the servers as they come online. So in the queues here, we have four queues, the input, output, error, and audit queues. And as you can see, uh, with the output queue, we've run this uh, demo before, so we've been already processing results. So let's jump into one of the input queues. So within each queue, you can set certain policies you know, when you want the messages to time uh, if, when you want the message to time out, and we also give you the ability to view the input messages within the right scale dashboard. But what's important here is you know, right scale will never lose a job. So if something happens on a server, you know, that job will be placed back on the queue to be processed later. So it's a, it sounds like that. So there's, there's, there's monitoring and then further operational remediation that's going on based on things that are actually happening in the queue. And then what we're going to talk about in a second is the, the monitoring and remediation that's going on, the things that are actually happening within the worker itself. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. So right, now I'm going to hand it back to Josh who's going to talk about automation management. Great. Well, thanks, Dave. So what you've just seen there was the way you can actually take advantage of this pre-built system and then through kicking off a single job by the single server, uh, we just provisioned, it looks like, nine or ten different servers there that are now going through the process. And we're going we're gonna to check back and show you how you do further automation around uh, how these scale up and down in just a second. So let's talk about automated management. And th this is one of the key value propositions of why customers use RightScale and why they leverage cloud resources through our platform. Um, so the reality is there is a whole host of complexity that's associated with running deployments in the cloud that are at scale and multi-tier. Uh, what we've done within RightScale is focus on, simply put, automating as much of the process as we possibly can. So all of those routine tasks that a sysadmin would otherwise have to do manually um, whether it's provisioning servers or whether it's doing runtime configurations, um, RightScale has created a rules-based platform which allows you to take a lot of that work and automate it. Uh, I want to talk specifically about uh, some areas of automation that are very relevant to grid and back processing and specific around scaling. Um, there's two different categories of automation as it relates to auto-scaling. Um, in the first section, you have auto-scaling that is based on uh, specific alerts and what we call escalations. Uh, alerts and escalations. So RightScale is monitoring a whole host of system level metrics. And uh, the way to think about this is any metric that RightScale is monitoring, and those can be things like uh, idle time on the CPU, those can be disk I.O., you know, any of the metrics out of the hundreds and hundreds that RightScale is monitoring, you can have this system trigger escalations, which are remedial actions in the platform. Uh, those actions can be reconfigure something. They can be reconfigure an entire system. They can be launch a server, terminate a server, promote a server. Um, so a whole host of different configuration that's available through this alert-based system. Um, but secondly, you can actually override, in the case of auto-scaling, um, the alert and escalation environment using a simple time of day and day of week schedule. So this becomes very important, particularly in any sort of circumstance where you know what the traffic patterns are like. So financial services, Stock market in New York, it closes and opens pretty much the same time every single day. All right? So if you need to do specific workloads around that, you can have systems that are automatically uh, provisioning and configuring themselves to be ready for the workload at the point of market close or whatever you set as a user to do your jobs. So that's one whole area of server array automation and auto scaling. But the second big area is about 
uh, remediation that's associated with various different attributes of the queue. Um, so again, this is think of this as right scale monitoring the behavior and what's going on within Amazon's uh, SQS service. Uh, and there's a couple key things that we recommend and we see customers use as best practice with how you'd have something in the queue trigger remediation uh, within EC2. Uh, the first is simply how big is that queue? All right, so the number of messages that are residing in that queue, because of that, as that grows, you may want to uh, provision additional resources or you may want to allow RightScale to deprovision those resources. Um, the key with scaling is going down is as important as going up when it comes to cost savings and optimization. The second is around uh, message aging. So this is how long is that message residing in the queue? Um, this becomes very, very important when you're trying to adhere towards any specific SLA, whether that's an internal SLA to one of your constituents or whether that's an external SLA uh, to an end user. Um, and again, this also leverages the flexibility of the cloud. So if getting that job done in an hour is important to you, you have the access to the unlimited resources and the automation to do that. Um, so job aging is another very important thing. And then finally, there's also automation and intelligence uh, that RightScale has that tie back into the way Amazon charges you for the actual consumption. So Amazon charges, in the case of compute cycles, Amazon charges by the hour. So therefore, even if a server is idle, uh, the RightScale automation is intelligent enough to know that leave that server hanging around just in case you need it for an additional job. Um, so we'll keep that server live even in an idle state up until the last possible minute before we start the graceful deprovisioning and cleanup process to allow you to maximize the money that you've already spent because uh, it is an hour by hour charge process. So that just highlights some of the key areas of the server array scaling. Um, the secret sauce to all this is those server templates that Dave mentioned. Right? Server templates, because they are an abstraction layer above uh, in this case, the image and the virtual resources provided by Amazon, you have the ability to use a single server template to provision and configure multiple different resources. And you're interacting with that server template at an individual component basis uh, using write scripts, and then we also support uh, Chef from Opscode. So because of that, servers can do what we call launch in context. Okay? Server templates share common environment variables with other server templates that are part of the respective system. All right? So without that, you'd have auto launching, but you wouldn't have the other and often more complicated part of auto scaling, which is the auto configuration of bringing a resource into an environment where it's a productive contributor without a sysadmin or other uh, human resource to have to go in and configure that instance. So what are some of the key benefits uh, of this automated management as it comes to uh, configuration and scaling? So uh, the first one is around remediation. Um, you know, again, just to reiterate, you know, right scale, because of the way our system is architected, the right scale daemon is running on all of these instances within Amazon, and then right scale is also uh, keeping an eye on and adjusting the environment based on various different attributes of the queue. Um, so with this, you have the ability to dynamically configure instances based on what's going on in the instance itself as well as the queue. We also have automation and pre-configuration around complex batch processing or what's known as chaining. So here you have the ability where you may be running one batch process whose outputs become the inputs of a second process. Um, so this involves multiple different arrays. You may actually want these arrays in different areas of different regions within Amazon. So RightScale has automation and pre-configuration that makes that very, very easy. The next area is around uh, SLAs. And we see this an awful lot in financial services, and we also see this an awful lot in, in media. Um, and think of this as you no longer are bound by uh, the situation where, you know what, your job's in a queue. It's one of many jobs we're trying to run, and we think it's going to be done by X. Here's a situation where you as a user, you as an operator, can set the specific business rules around how you want your job processed. If you need that job done in an hour, it has the ability to get done in an hour. Next, we have this notion of efficient spending. So that's what I mentioned earlier around you know, right scale being smart enough to understand how Amazon's business model, charge model, works. So if we're going to provision a resource, that starts the clock ticking. And we know, regardless of the behavior of those resources, so even if that resource is idle, 
um, and not actually processing a job, our system will keep it online, keep it as part of that environment just in case because you've already bought it for that full hour, uh, so keep it live for that full hour. And then finally, we have how do you use this to lower costs? Um, there are a whole host of things, you know, in addition to some of the economic benefits that we're going to talk about in a few more slides. But one way is leveraging uh, Amazon Reserve instances. Um, so here's think of this as a lease. So basically, you are buying the rights to an instance on on Amazon, uh, and by doing so, you're contractually committing yourself uh, to a lower rate. So you know, very good way if you have some visibility into the jobs that you're going to run. Here's a way you can get compute power at a much lower cost. Um, Dave mentioned spot pricing earlier. So this is, this is really exciting and going to be very, very interesting when we fully incorporate this into right scale. So we will be supporting spot pricing. You know, think of this as, as, as a market, an eBay market uh, for servers, where you can essentially enter your bid. Uh, and then based on what that bid is, the spot price of those particular instances is going to change every hour within Amazon. Um, what RightScale will have the ability to do is add some intelligent bidding uh, to your server array. Um, so this is going to be particularly interesting for companies that aren't dealing with time-sensitive SLAs. So if you're a pharmaceutical company or you're biopharma and you need to analyze you know, terabytes worth of, of, of DNA analysis, um, you need it done within a broad time period, but you don't necessarily need it done uh, in the next two hours. So here's a situation where the right scale automation, the Amazon reserve instances, and the Amazon spot pricing can automatically make sure that you get the best price possible. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dave. And Dave, why don't you show us um, how you'd actually go into these server arrays and do some of the configuration that I just talked about. Sure. So I'm going to show you the different ways you can configure array or different scaling options and just you know, to present you know, what, this, what an array is. So the first thing you'll notice is the server options. So from the last demo, we had those servers um, provisioned based off a server template. So that's what you're seeing here. So it's based off a worker server template. And you can set things like the SSH key and security group and any other cloud uh, preferences um, when, they, when, they're, when they are provisioned. The next thing is the server allocation policy. So within the server allocation policy, you can define your, your min and max count in your array. And why, this, why is this important? So with the min count, you typically want to set a minimum of you know, one to two servers so you have servers hanging around to process any incoming, um, any incoming jo jobs. You want to set the max count you know, in case you want to uh, budget within cost so you, don't have, so you don't scale indefinitely. So Dave, what's, a, what's an availability zone just for those uh, that aren't aware? Want to reiterate that? Sure. Amazon has you know, regions, and you know, within each region it has availability zones, which you can consider um, separate data centers. So you know, in this case, we're weighting our workers into two different availability zones within the uh, US East region. And this is important because we're architecting for high availability. So Amazon does a great job providing uh, access to compute resources within separate regions and availability zones. So they really provide you with the ability to, to architect with high availability in mind. And Dave, sorry to interrupt you, but just looking on the left there, it looks like all those back test workers have reached an operational state and they've been operational for about seven minutes. So if my math is correct, we've actually provisioned these resources and they're doing jobs in under 10 minutes, it looks like. Exactly. So if we were to jump back, you know, these results Probably, probably would be finished by now. So availability zones in Amazon regions, you have access to essentially multiple virtual data centers, right? You have multiple virtual data centers and in different um, regions of the world. Okay. Uh, Dave, I just want to interrupt you one more time. We had a question on back on the top there on, on images there. Uh, the question is, does RightScale support additional, additional OSs, it looks like, other than just Linux variants? So currently we're in our um, beta test program for Windows. So we have support for different variants of Linux and we're up and coming with uh, Windows support. Okay, so Windows Early Access. Um, yeah, so that's going on. That has been going on now for about a month. Um, so those interested, just, just get in touch with us and um, we'll, uh, we'll get in as many as we can to the Windows Early Access program. We get asked on Windows support yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Quite a bit. <laughs> So I'll continue on with uh, the queue options here. So I'll, I'll edit this so I can show you different ways you can scale. 
So currently this is using the queue size. So what that means is for every, in this case, 10 jobs in the queue, we want to provision an additional resource or additional instance. And it's monitoring the input and sending audit, me um, audit messages to the audit queue. But another way you can scale is based off how long those jobs have been in the queue. So as Josh mentioned previously, you, know, you would use this for SLA requirements to make sure uh, to finish these jobs on time. So if they've been in the queue for a specified duration, well, we need to kick up um, and spin off more servers uh, to handle that job volume. Now, the, are these parameters that are in there, is that something that RightScale is, is setting defaults on? Do I, have a, do I, as a user, have the option to change those, or what, where are those coming from? Yeah, so that's you know, definitely user, user configurable. Um, you would probably want to benchmark your application to determine how many jobs um, or how many jobs your server can handle during within the hour. So, so that's an important note, I guess. So it's, uh, you know, basically there still is, we're, we're not taking off the plate of the, of the user here, the responsibility to understand their application and their code and their behavior of the jobs they need to run, right? So we can, we can certainly help them predict the type of instances and the resources that they're going to need. Uh, but the application code is entirely their responsibility. That's right. And that's actually a good lead into the audit entry analysis, which, which you can see that's checked off here. So hey, one, one question before you get there. Um, so, Brian, why don't I throw this to you? Is a question on uh, the price for SQS. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for SQS, the price is uh, and it's actually fairly inexpensive. It's $1 for a up to a million uh, messages. All right. <laughs> So I'll continue on with the, uh, the audit entry analysis, which will help you benchmark uh, these numbers. So RightScale consumes the audit messages for each job, and that just gives you insight into the grid statistics. You know, how, long each job, you know, how long each job took to process, how many um, bytes were transferred between the instances and S3, um, the number of work units that were provisioned, and a graph showing how many instances were launched over time to handle the job volume. So this day, these types of results, I'm guessing, so you'd use this to essentially optimize the next run that you want to make, correct? That's right. Okay. And then if you see that you can, you know, you might want to provision uh, a larger instance to handle your workload, you, you can do that by setting uh, that option on the arrays page. So the newly provisioned server will be launched with a larger instance. Got it. So. So just to reiterate on that, so you can you can actually have within a single array multiple different instance types. Yes. Yeah, so you once you make that change, any newly provisioned server will have a larger instance, and you'll have that set of um, servers with you know the smaller and larger instances. Got it. All right. So now I'm going to hand it back to Josh. So Josh. Great. So. Before I chime back in, so it looks like one other question, Brian, on SQS, um, it's availability in the various different Amazon regions. I mean, that's a global resource, correct? Correct. Yep, absolutely. So uh, today, today it's available in all of our regions, and as we bring new regions online, you should expect SQS to be available uh, either at launch or shortly thereafter. Great. Thanks, Brian. So let's finish up and talk about uh, economics. So let's talk a little bit about how to think about TCO and how to start to arrive at uh, you know, the cost equation here with, with doing grid and batch processing in the cloud uh, as opposed to in the internal data center. Um, so again, let's focus on kind of end user and then, and then operator attributes here. So first on the end user, the direct cost savings here. Uh, the biggest one, you know, as far as hardware is concerned, is you know, this is this is zero capex. Right? So you're not having to buy equipment, you're not having to install and certify equipment. All right, Amazon's doing all that for you. So think back to Brian's slide on kind of taking a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting off of your plate and putting it on theirs. Um, with that, you're paying for only what you've used. Um, very, very important. You know, think of this almost as you know, turning computing resources into a utility like electricity. So you turn it on, you're going to get billed. As soon as you turn it off, that billing stops. Um, and then finally, on the cost savings, you have uh, RightScale as a management system being delivered as a software as a service. Um, so the RightScale benefits can be applied to any and all of the Amazon resources, and you're not having to worry about you know, reconfiguring or paying multiple times as you bring on different work groups. So this is just some of the, the highlights on the, on the direct cost savings side. 
but another area that's often overlooked is the impact that this has on business agility. And this is often where the economic benefits can be you know, considerably greater than the actual direct cost savings. Um, so the first is this notion of your job is always first in line. Um, so think back to those dynamics we mentioned, those issues that were brought to our attention uh, as we started this webinar off. So not having transparency as a user into when that job will be completed. Um, to not knowing, you know, are you third in line, fourth in line. So your job is always first in line. If you need it in an hour, if you need it in two hours, you have the flexibility as an operator <laughs> to ensure that the appropriate resources uh, are at your disposal to do that. Um, next is that notion of unlimited resources. So uh, Amazon's capacity and Amazon's uh, data center and various different uh, virtual data center resource pools uh, there's a strong argument that they probably far exceed yours. <laughs> so there is significant, significant, we call it virtually infinite, uh, resources that are at your disposal. And what this brings to the table is a game-changing environment as an operator, where no longer are any of the uh, hurdles associated with IT, whether it's procurement, installation, certification, operational, no longer are any of those hurdles uh, getting in your way from a business agility standpoint. When you need it, it's there. It's there in a matter of minutes. And then finally is this notion of pre-configuration, so leveraging proven architectures. You know, the, the cloud in a lot of ways, particularly within RightScale, is one big community. Um, and one of the key benefits of a software as a service type offering, and this isn't unique to RightScale certainly, but any SaaS based offering, is it's constantly getting smarter. It's constantly getting better. So it's taking advantage of all the work and all the learnings and all the different configurations uh, that are part of that platform and doing a rapid evolution and rapid release cycle on the software itself. Um, so RightScale approximately every five or six weeks is introducing new features and new functionality within the RightScale platform and all of our customers benefit from that collective learnings. Um, and then last but not least on the proven aspect is, again, think back to that right scale intro slide. You know, we have launched and managed over a million servers now. We've been at this longer than anyone else um, as far as the management is concerned. Um, so we have through that leveraged and learned a whole host of different best practices on a variety of cloud-based workloads. Um, so you have the advantage of, of being able to leverage that in your own deployments. We like to show this because it's a very simple way to uh, kind of capture, you know, just how powerful uh, the economic equation is. And it's this notion of a cost-neutral equation. And, and what I mean by that is, let's say you have uh, a 10,000 job run that you need to do. Um, and, you know, you have two options here with the cloud. Uh, one may be, let's say normally internally that 10,000 job run would leverage a, a two-server environment within your internal data center. Um, that may be out of necessity um, because you're dealing with uh, significant resource limitations. That may be because you have the necessary software only running on those two machines. There may be a variety of reasons why that is. You can certainly take that environment and run it on a two-server cloud within Amazon. Um, however, this cost-neutral equ equation, what this is all about is you're going to pay the exact same amount as far as the Amazon uh, consumption charges whether you run a two-server cloud or a 1,000-server cloud uh, for that 10,000 job run. All right, so you're paying the exact same. Um, that may not seem like that big of a deal until you look at the business agility benefit uh, that you get out of that. So specifically, that two-server cloud is going to take you 500 times longer uh, to run at the same cost as it would using a 1,000-server cloud. So incredibly, incredibly powerful stuff is, you know, think about all the different ways you can now leverage this cost-neutral equation uh, in the cloud. When you need it, you can get it, and the resources are always there. And then the last slide we wanted to leave you with is just one uh, more detailed analysis about the actual hard costs and the savings that you can derive by moving to uh, Amazon and RightScale. Um, this was actually taken out. This is an excerpt of a recent TCO uh, study that we commissioned. Uh, it was done by a third party called the FactPoint Group, and it actually just got published uh, two weeks ago. So this is uh, a study that was initiated by RightScale but done by a third party. And as it relates to grid, we asked them to take a look at comparing two different in-house grids, uh, one using commercial software and the other one using open source. 
and then compare that to doing that same workload uh, in, uh, in the cloud, in the AWS cloud, using RightScale as a management tool. And I won't read those numbers to you, but the net net is RightScale and Amazon came in at less than one third of the price of even the in-house grid using open source. So dramatic, dramatic savings. And important to note here, this doesn't include any of the business agility uh, economic benefits that we just talked about on the previous slide. So with that, we're going to continue to uh, answer those questions that have been coming in on the log. So, so Daniel is, uh, is still available and typing away. Um, but why don't we pause here and just tackle a few other questions. Um, before we get there, we'll leave this slide up. But RightScale does have a uh, developer edition. So this is, uh, this is completely free of charge. So just grab your Amazon credentials, and you can go get a RightScale developer edition. Um, of course, we'd love to talk to you and answer any questions that you may have. Um, we're used to that consultation. We're used to kind of helping customers figure out how do I get started, what do I need to worry about. Uh, and two other important things to note, um, we do do quite a few webinars, as, as hopefully some of you know. Um, so we have a rich webinar archive. Um, these are very content-rich webinars, um, both best practice webinars that we put on our own, uh, as well as joint webinars with partners like Amazon. So thank you again, Brian. Uh, as well as other third parties that we work with. And then that TCO white paper I mentioned, so that is ready for distribution. Um, it'll be posted on the site uh, hopefully pretty soon, but if you'd like uh, an advanced copy, uh, just shoot us an email at tco at rightscale.com, and we'll go ahead and get that right out to you. Josh, we have a question here. Uh, what is the Rightscale cost model? The Rightscale cost model. Okay, so Rightscale is delivered as a software as a service. Um, so it is subscription-based pricing. Um, so there are certain editions of RightScale uh, starting at as, as excuse me starting at as low as five hundred dollars a month, and then they go up from there. Um, and then each of those editions includes a certain set of features, and then also a, a certain amount of time on Amazon. Uh, if you exceed that time, uh, the Pricing model is exactly like Amazon's EC2 pricing model. So right, you'll pay additional fees to RightScale based on um, the usage by instance by hour. So there's various different instance types that Amazon supports. They all cost a different amount. Um, so depending on what instance type you're using, uh, that will dictate uh, the associated charge. All right. Thanks. And another question. Um, do you support MS Windows instances, so Microsoft, and what type of instances? So we previously mentioned that we uh, are currently uh, running a beta program for Windows. We have people actively, or we're actively developing this. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of our most requested features is having feature parity with our with our Linux environments. Okay, now appreciate that. Um, so again, keep the logs open. Just keep firing those away. Uh, looks like Brian. Another question for you. Uh, this one on, on spot pricing. Um, is that available also in all of Amazon's regions? Uh, actually, yeah. But I believe spot pricing is. It's more of a pricing model than it is necessarily a region availability model. Right. So it will fluctuate based off of what uh, instance availability is is available and where it's located. But it, yes, it should be. And then maybe it's worth noting. So how does how does spot pricing tie into reserve uh, instances on Amazon? That, that's a good question, and uh, I did want to uh, make one point of clarification. Um, so, so earlier uh, in, in the discussion, Josh had mentioned that uh, reserved instances does require a, a some kind of a long-term or fixed-term contract between Amazon and our customers. Um, that, that's uh, there's just a slight correction there. Uh, the customers who are buying reserved instances get the option to buy a one-year or a three-year term. What that does is it requires you to pay a, a marginal upfront fee, which basically does two things. One, it actually guarantees you the capacity for those instances. So those instances are yours. They're taken out of general population, and they're there for you to use them. Now, um, once you do decide to use the instances, actually your hourly rate actually is quite uh, drastically decreased from what our standard on-demand pricing is. Right? So effectively, if you're running system steady state and you do a one-year RI purchase, it, you, the effective discount for you is a, uh, approaching 35%. So there is no contract you have to sign. You do have to put the money up front, 
Um, but then again, you're, there's no there's there's no requirement that you stay on or run instances for any period of time. You simply you know fire them up whenever you want, but you pay a reduced hourly rate. Uh, so reserved instances are a good way for you to guarantee capacity and reduce your instance uh, hourly price for systems that you believe you're going to be you, you either a need need to know that they'll be there when you need them, and b ones that you'll be running um, more in a steady state manner. Spot pricing, on the other hand, is a great way for you to actually be able to essentially bid in the open market um, for instances. Now, spot pricing is the, the price for the spot instance is really uh, follows the whole economic paradigm of supply and demand. Right? So if there is an excess demand of a particular instance, um, you know, we allow the market to actually set what price they're willing to pay for that. Now, what, what happens, though, is if you set a particular price and the supply becomes limited, therefore the price goes up, you have to be. You have to expect the fact that if the if the spot price actually goes above your what you're willing to pay, your instances will actually go away, and they'll be allocated to somebody who's willing to pay higher, right? So uh, spot pricing is ideal for people who are doing jobs that don't require a fixed time for it to, to get done, um, and you can do things like batch processing or things like that. You know, at like two o'clock in the morning on a Saturday. Um, so uh, the combination of reserved instances and spot pricing actually allows you to truly maximize the uh, the economic efficiencies of the cloud. Great. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Brian. Sorry about the, the confusion there earlier. And then also one last note just to confirm for the audience. So re uh, reserved instances can be by region within Amazon. Uh, Again, as you yes. think about high availability and how you want to set up your environment, uh, you can have those applied to a specific region within Amazon? Uh, yes, absolutely. You can actually specify, um, if required, you can actually specify which uh, AZ you want, you, uh, which a availability zone, not just region, that you want those uh, RIs uh, located in. And Brian, maybe I'll kick this, uh, this next question back to you as well, because it's really more of an Amazon um, uh, handling than a right scale, which is the, the licensing and the charge model associated with Windows. Sure. Um, good. Good question. Um, we. Uh, I really didn't address it in great detail when I was going through my slides. But one of the, if you recall, one of the sli uh, in one of my slides, uh, one of the factors that you need to take into consideration when you're thinking about building out your own infrastructure is the uh, software and operating system licensing costs associated with building out your own infrastructure. So what you can, um, when you look at our pricing for Windows Server, for example. Uh, that price, like for example, the small instance, which is 12 cents an hour, that price actually includes the uh, Windows license in it as well. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, another question on spot pricing is around the decommissioning of instances. So, and you know, how is that um, how is that handled the shutdown procedure? So, what what we have within RightScale, you know, back to that server template and our our approach and our methodology, a server template includes not only the ability for the auto provisioning and configuration of an instance, but also the graceful decommissioning. So there's, there's three different categories of configuration that goes on within a server template. Uh, the first is around uh, boot time configuration. You know, again, you can use uh, open, open scripting languages uh, with write skills, write scripts, as well as we have full support for Chef cookbooks if, if that's your preference. Um, there's a second category of configuration around runtime configuration. So that also is defined at a server template level. Uh, and then the final is around um, decommission scripts. So as also part of that same server template, you can essentially have right scale handle a graceful uh, cleanup and decommissioning process of any instance that gets terminated, whether it's because of the spot bit changing and it going away, or whether it's because that resource has been idle for too long and you have right scale shut it down, or any other reason why you terminate an instance, there's a graceful cleanup process that our platform will take it through. Then, of course, it gets thrown back into the Amazon uh, Amazon pool. And then, this is one thing I can add to that. So in the context of the grid environment, if you're using it with spot instances and the younger instance does decommission, well, that job won't be lost. So you can take advantage of the price and guarantee that um, none of your jobs will be lost during that process. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. So what you're saying there, as far as, as far as the SQS automation is concerned, that job is going to remain in the input queue uh, until its completion, whether that's from a permanent error and goes into the error results queue, or whether that's a successful completion and it goes into the results queue. Absolutely right. Okay. 
Got it. Uh, it looks like next question is around what are the options mentioned regarding right scale customization and or white labeling? Um, well, there's there's a couple different ways to think about this. Um, we have organizations that use right scale's management system um, as a centralized tool that they then invite access uh, for individual users to. Um, so there's a situation where the option is uh, usually a co-branded option. Um, so certainly that is that is available. Um, the the second scenario is where third parties, you know, we work with a variety of different system integrators. Um, so we work very closely with Amazon on that, uh, and their system integrators tend to be ours and vice versa. And those integrators are often using right scale in a white label capacity. So they're delivering more complete solution stacks uh, and systems directly for their clients uh, who don't uh, often realize that behind the scenes is not only the right scale management system, but, but Amazon Web Services. So there, there's certainly options there, um, and we're happy to discuss those with you. Great, so with that, um, this is going to end the audio portion, um, but we'll continue to keep the chat log open uh, for a few more minutes as long as questions keep coming in. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone again uh, for your participation today. Thanks for sticking with us, particularly given that it's St. Patrick's Day. So those of you on the East Coast, I'm extremely jealous. I'm a, I'm a former uh, Boston guy, but lived several years in New York, so enjoy the parade and have a good, uh, have a good time. Be safe. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thank you.